Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Seth Lloyd, uh, who's uh, our first speaker in Quantum AI series uh, in 2014. Uh, Seth Lloyd is um, considered as uh, one of the founding fathers of quantum information science, and uh, he's done uh, major contributions to a broad a range of uh, areas in uh, quantum computing, quantum control, quantum simulation, uh, transport, uh, illumination, sensing, and quantum communication. So he's been uh, um, uh, many groundbreaking uh, 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 research in over the last 25 years. And uh, so he's a, actually a theoretical physicist who happened to uh, be a professor at uh, mechanical engineering at MIT and would like to consider himself as a quantum mechanic. <laughs> And, Your uh, quanta are broke. We fixed yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and um, I, I happen to have the opportunity to work with him over the uh, last six, seven years uh, while I, I was um, at Harvard and MIT. Uh, so we uh, worked on a number of uh, interesting projects, uh, such as uh, uh, developing a theory of noise-assisted uh, quantum transport with applications uh, to biological systems and also more recently uh, um, developing uh, new co quantum algorithms with applications to machine learning. That This is actually the topic that he's going to discuss uh, today, and uh, we are very happy that he accepted our, uh, our invitation to, to, to come here and present this result. Great. Thank you very much, Masood. And let's thank uh, Seth Lloyd. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good idea to clap now, because after I'm done, who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for, for bringing me here. Masood uh, was a postdoctoral fellow with me, and then I, he was work, working so well, I hired him as a research scientist, and everything was doing great, and then Google hired him away. So, and, and actually, it's OK, because I miss Masood telling me what to do. Um, so now he can tell you what to do. And my, my advice is do it, because <laughs> it always seemed to work out. <clears throat> All right, so uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, I lived in Santa Monica like 20 years ago and used to come to the Rose Cafe all the time, which is around the corner. Um, I don't think this building was here then. Uh, uh, but I have a question. So I know this is a very general audience. So, so I'm going to talk about quantum mechanics and machine learning algorithms. But my first question is, who here has studied quantum mechanics at some point in their lives? Who here has not studied quantum mechanics? All right, and the remainder of people who are people who have and have not studied quantum <laughs> mechanics. And those are the real, those are the people who know it intuitively. <laughs> okay, good. So, so um, then let me just start off with a really brief course in quantum computing. Um, that the, so the, the exam will be easy, I swear. Uh, so, um, uh, the thing to remember about quantum mechanics is that um, quantum mechanics is weird. This is, um, this is a, uh, a technical term. Um, <clears throat> uh, my brother, who's sitting right here, told me he once saw James Brown in a concert, and somebody said, so James, what are you going to play next? And James said, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's got to be funky. And uh, quantum mechanics is the funky science, uh, <laughs> because <clears throat> It's strange, it's weird, it goes against your intuitions, and um, it's hard to understand what's going on. So, um, so then, if I say some things that sound strange and weird and against your intuitions, that's good. Because uh, as Niels Bohr once said, anybody who can contemplate quantum mechanics without getting dizzy hasn't properly understood it. Except he said it in Danish, which was more impressive sounding. All right. so, <clears throat> So the key thing about quantum mechanics, here's a key feature, is that if I have something like a, a particle, so this is a particle. By the way, I apologize. This is my, um, I, I don't do PowerPoint unless I have signed a government grant that requires me to deliver PowerPoint. And the reason is that PowerPoint is a form of Satan. Um, and, <laughs> and I object to the government requiring me to perform satanic rituals. But, <laughs> but that's the way it is. You know, life is too short for bullet points. So, okay, so key feature about quantum mechanics is if I have a particle such as an electron, now we're normally accustomed to thinking of particles as like little tiny basketballs or something and they can sit in one place at a time. 
but um, a particle such as an electron, if you get to things that are that small, a particle can be in two places at once. Now, I know this sounds kind of strange. So how can a particle be in two places at once? Well, the thing is, in quantum mechanics, a particle has a wave that's associated with it. So particle over here has a wave associated with over there. Particle over there has a wave that's associated with it over there. The wave tells you kind of what's the probability of finding the particle in a particular spot. But quantum mechanics has a feature that waves add up, just like waves on the beach out there. And um, so if this is an OK wave, and if this is an, an OK wave, then this is also an OK wave. So it's OK to have a wave for the electron, where the electron is both here and there simultaneously. Now, I know this sounds weird, and it does contradict our intuitions about what things do macroscopically, even if, you know, even if well, I, I'm, this is I can't make basketball, because I'm from Boston. I can't talk about basketball here. But, so let's talk about soccer. Even if like the Lionel Messi makes you know, the, the football, the soccer ball, look like it's two places at once, it isn't really. However, quantum mechanically, things are like this all the time. All right? Everybody OK with this? You're, you shouldn't be OK. This is wrong. I mean, this is like absolutely wrong. You know, Einstein hated this crap. This is like, he said, this is awful. I hate this. My intuition tells me this is wrong. And he didn't, never believed in quantum mechanics. You know, so, well, he was wrong. I mean, he was wrong. So, uh, so now, um, so this kind of wave particle duality is what this called. When you translate this into a situation, uh, uh, some device that's performing computation, like a computer, well, on an ordinary computer, uh, a zero is stored by having a whole bunch of electrons here, capacitor uncharged. And a one is stored by having a whole bunch of electrons over here, capacitor charged. And if you go down to a single electron transistor, you could have one electron over here is zero. And one electron over here is one. So electron over here is one. And the same electron being here and there at the same time is zero and one at the same time. So if you look at quantum mechanics and logic, or just bits, quantum bits, or qubits, as they're whimsically called. I mean, I don't know. But when I was a kid, a qubit was this distance right here from your elbow to your <laughs> finger. I still think of that as a qubit. But you know, a quantum bit is now a qubit, spelled with a Q. So a qubit, quantum bit or qubit, spelled differently too, can be 0 and 1 at the same time. Okay? So that's the primary feature of quantum mechanics. And quantum computers operate by trying to take advantage of this. Um, for many years, being a professor of quantum mechanical engineering, I used to say, you know, I was at a wedding, uh, uh, and I was seated with, this was at, at our cousin's wedding. And it was, she's a cultural anthropologist. And I was sitting at this table of all these cultural anthropologists. And they asked me what I did. And I said, I said oh, um, you know, I, I take atoms, and I exploit their intrinsic information processing power to make them compute. And they were like, oh my god, that's the most politically incorrect thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so I was sitting next to a, a, a Barbara Ehrenreich was at this table, who she's a wonderful social commentator. And she actually has a degree in chemistry, as it turns out. So she got me to explain it better, and finally they were OK. They figured I wasn't really exploiting elementary particles too badly. And afterwards, her, her, her companion, who was this older African-American activist from Greensboro, North Carolina, put his arm around my shoulder and said, Seth, I, I suggest that the next time you describe what you do, that you say, you empower atoms to compute. <laughs> and it was a transformational moment in my life, because I went just like that in a nanosecond from being an exploiter of atoms to an empowerer of atoms. So <clears throat> how can we empower quantum bits, qubits, atoms, and electrons that we can manipulate at this subatomic scale, atomic and subatomic scale, how can we empower them to compute? And if we can do so, how can we exploit, I mean, sorry, how can we use <laughs> use this feature that quantum bits can effectively read or register 0 and 1 at the same time to do things that ordinary classical computers can't. OK? So any questions so far? Yeah? What's the difference between this, like a unit that goes four value instead of um, real properties? I mean, the real advantage. What's the real advantage of it? I'm sorry? Yeah, uh, I think it has its good holes, left and right, or either with the combination is just more value, possible value. What's more? 
Yeah, so, so let me, I, I'm not exactly sure I understand the, the, I mean, actually you seem to be, be in some, you know, you accept immediately that it can be zero and one at the same time. So you, you obviously like lived with this for a long time. Let me just say more precisely how this can be so, because actually there's a little bit of mathematics has to take place now. So actually, so how many people here have a background in computer science here? All right. How many people don't have a background in computer science? All right, okay, good. How many people do in, no, never mind. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, there we go. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> all right, so let me give you a little bit of the mathematics of how that this works, and then, then actually maybe this will help with your, with your question. So the way that the mathematics works is that actually this state zero, we're gonna call, we, we can call, suppose we have something that can have two states, a quantum bit. It corresponds to a vector in a two-dimensional vector space. And one corresponds to an orthogonal vector in a two-dimensional vector space. And a general qubit, so a generic qubit, corresponds to something which is um, uh, a generic complex vector in this two-dimensional complex vector space. This is just mathematically what they correspond to, all right? And the way that this works, and so this, of course, this is just equal to alpha times this plus beta times this. And often, uh, and there's a quantum mechanical notation right here, where this vector is called zero. This, this means this funny little thing, this brackety-like thing, means that whatever's inside it is quantum mechanical. That's like, that's what it means. <laughs> it's, called a, it's called a Dirac bracket, this, this notation. But I, I'm just defining it to mean this vector. And it just means it's a quantum mechanical doohickey. It's another technical term. So this is equal to alpha times zero plus beta times one. So, <clears throat> so this means these alphas and the beta re represent basically the relative height of these. And because they're complex numbers, there's a phase. And you demand that the modulus squared of alpha squared plus the modulus squared of beta squared is equal to one because alpha squared is equal to the probability of finding, if I make a measurement on this qubit and I say, electron, are you over here? Are you zero? Or are you over there? Are you one? Then this modulus squared of alpha is the probability of getting zero and beta squared is the probability of getting one. And when you add them up, they have to add up to one. And why should this be true? Nobody knows, okay? This is just the way it is, right? You gotta suck it up. Right? <laughs> uh, no, it, it's actually, it, in fact, this is a very, this, this fact that this, it's the square of this amplitude, this, this complex number, this is a probability. Um, this is the most, this is footnote in this paper written by Max Born in 1929. He says, oh look, the, this amplitude is proportional to the probability. It says that in the paper. But then in the footnote it says, under more consideration, I realize that the probability is the amplitude squared. <laughs> note added in proof. It's the most famous footnote in physics, actually. OK, so, so nobody knows why this is the case, actually. If I had longer time, I could give you some arguments for why it might be. But the real answer is nobody knows. All right? So are, are people OK with this? This is, like, this is what a quantum bit is in, in the formulation of quantum mechanics. As okay as you'll ever be, that's right. I mean, the thing is, the nice thing is because the great thing about is that computer scientists know much more about, not only about algorithms and computation than I do, but they know a whole bunch of stuff about linear algebra, which is, um, because what is computer science but glorified linear algebra, and, or at least much computer science. And actually this fact that linear algebra is very, very, very important in computer science is what I'm now going to exploit. Oh, sorry, not exploit, I'm not supposed to exploit things. Um, <clears throat> this is what empowers quantum systems to be able to do interesting things that classical systems can't do. Because quantum mechanics at its very guts, at the very bottom of quantum mechanics, it's about vectors, okay? It's about vectors in complex Hilbert spaces, they're called, because there's actually a norm for this, but it, in complex vector spaces. And quantum computers, when they're flipping bits and moving things around, are actually performing linear operations on these vectors. So if you look at the kind of the f mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics, the people who have taken quantum mechanics know it's all about linear algebra, matrices, eigenvectors, eigenvalues, blah, 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 right? Which is what our family uses for et cetera. 
<coughs> it's okay if you don't write it in a paper. <coughs> All right. All right. So that's what we're going to use. And this, in fact, is, is this feature that quantum mechanics is about vectors, matrices, linear operations. The way that we're going to construct quantum machine learning algorithms is to map ordinary machine learning algorithms when they have to do with manipulating vectors, figuring out inner products, uh, performing linear transformations, inverting matrices, stuff like that. We're going to map all those transformations onto things we can do at the quantum mechanical level. OK? And that's the basic intuition for why this whole method works. And uh, I should say that, that uh, uh, the reason I got involved in this is that, that um, Pat, I'm a student of my colleagues, Patrick Rebentrost, who's a postdoc at MIT right now. He was a graduate student at Harvard. He came to my office a year ago in November, and he said, Seth, we should work on quantum machine learning. And I said, machine learning, what's that? And he, <laughs> he said, look, it's like all about this manipulation of vectors and things like that. I said, oh, I see. So <clears throat> anyway, so the dumbass intuition is that lots of machine learning tasks are about linear manipulations of vectors in large vector spaces. And quantum mechanics is all about vectors in large vector spaces. And so maybe you can do these manipulations quantum mechanically. And that dumbass intuition turns out to be correct in a large number of cases. And also not correct in other cases, and that's very interesting. And so one of the things I'd like to explore here, since we have a group of people who I bet know a hell of a lot more about machine learning than I do, is maybe we can cook up some examples of things where this works, might work, that we haven't thought of. And um, Masood and Hartmut and these guys are working on trying to figure out things that works, and also to figure out things places where it doesn't work, because failure, though less fun than success, is often more illuminating. OK. All right. Everybody ready for the, that? More questions is a good, good question time. Because, yes? So, how about things like uh, real numbers? Complex numbers. Complex numbers. Yeah, yeah. So the alpha, the alpha and beta, the way they show up is that their moduli squared are probabilities. So you never actually measure their complex features directly. The way that you actually see their kind of complex features are in famous things like the double slit experiment, where you send these waves, which are complex waves. This is now a single electron, right? It corresponds to a wave that spreads out here. It shows up on a screen, and you get interference patterns between these uh, different waves coming through these slits. And so these interference patterns come from adding up these complex amplitudes, but you only end up having access to experimental information that's like, did the electron show up in some place here? So actually, it's the, it's, your question is a very good one, because though often you want to have information about these complex amplitudes, what you're going to do is you need to massage your problem. Um, in order to actually extract the information that you need. And that's often a difficult and complex thing to do. So in this case, you'll use a lot of you send a lot of electrons and measure where they go and that's how they It will be a bit like that. Yeah, absolutely. It will be like that. In fact, I, I'm gonna, I'll, let's, let, we'll start with this mapping of these states onto these kinds of, um, onto the kinds of problems that we're interested in in machine learning just right now, um, unless there are more questions at this point. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Um, if you want to, for example, uh, talk about machine algorithms and turn on the grid, could you do this until the internet system that is divided between the zero to one, the zero to one, and the infinity? Sure, yeah. You could, do, you could in fact, also uh, the, the uh, for elementary particles, the number of internal states depends upon their spin. So a massive spin one part, uh, electron, for instance, can be spinning up or spinning down. Or actually, you could just imagine have like three different places. Let's just imagine it like that, since, you, since that's where you're describing it. Sure. You could have a ternary system or a quaternary system. So yeah, it, often in the case of, of quantum computing, as in the case of classical, it's easier to manipulate things that just have two different states. But there's nothing to prevent you from doing that. And in fact, so this is a, it's in quantum mechanics, we often refer to Q dits, where you have d different possible states. And this is a very useful way for manipulating information at that scale. All right. So, so the first thing is, if I take a bunch of qubits, so let, suppose I have a qubit, and it can be, in, um, it has a, a, can, it can have two different states, like zero or one, and this is one electron. Then I could have another 
electron that could also be in different states. So right, this could be in two different states. Here's a third electron. <coughs> and then I have, if I have n different electrons, so these, each one of these sits in a, um, each one of these belongs in C2, this two-dimensional complex space. I put them together. It's in actually what's called the tensor product space. And if you don't know what the tensor product space is, don't worry. It's just what we have. It's when we put together a whole bunch of copies of C2. It's in C2 to the n, which is basically a 2 to the n dimensional space. So there are 2 to the n different possible spaces, states here. And so the key feature here, and this is the key place where all our quantum speed ups will come, is that if I have n qubits, so n qubits, they live in this 2 to the n dimensional space. So when we're going to manipulate our vectors, the nice thing is if we have, some, if we have data, and our data is in the form of, let's say, some gigantic vector, which is a 2 to the n dimensional vector. Now, the classical representation of this data takes 2 to the n bits, or it, these could be you know, words, so 2 to the n times 32 for 32-bit words. right? But the thing is that our quantum state, we can have a quantum state of n qubits, and this has 2 to the n different components in it. So I can write this as I can make a quantum version of this vector. And this is e we're going to be equal to the sum over i, x sub i, this state i, where i is like, you know, i is an n bit. This is an n bit number. So this, this, is very, this is very important. So this is an important place to like be annoyed or ask questions or get confused. It's like, this is like, sort of like a wedding, but instead of having like one place where you have to speak now or forever hold your peace, there are like 10 places along the way. So if the bride and groom actually end up getting married here, it's going to be a miracle. <coughs> so <laughs> there are n, n bit number. This is n qubits, but there are two to the n different components. So because these quantum mechanical objects are vectors, I can have a small number of quantum bits that represents a huge honking vector. I, I, people are looking at me closely like I'm trying to pull the wool over your eyes. I'm, I'm, this is, it's, it's, it's just a feature of quantum mechanics that the states are vectors. I put together you know, n two-dimensional vectors. They live in a two to the n dimensional vector space. And so a state of n quantum bits is a vector on a two to the n dimensional space. And so this mapping is very important because this is the source of all of our quantum speed ups. We're going to be manipulating these huge honking vectors, things that would take a very, very large amount of power classically if I had these were all just numbers in a computer. All right, so if these were just like two to the n real numbers in a computer, it would take me a long time to do things like, you know, invert matrices multiplying by this number or take inner products of two of these vectors. But quantum mechanically, it's going to be basically exponentially faster for all of these operations. That will be the source of our speed up. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so, so actually, so, so we actually here we have, this is a very good point. So, so here, if these are complex numbers, we're actually demanding it for it to be, to be a legitimate vector that the, these numbers, the square of these numbers sum to one. So there's one constraint. So it's actually two to the n minus one vector. So there, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. You're exactly right. But it only reduces the constraint. It only constrains it by one constraint to make sure that all the squares add up to one so that they're legitimate these squares, moduli squared, are legitimate probabilities. And that's actually a very good point, I, I will, which I will, having mentioned it, I will proceed to try to ignore it for the rest of the talk because, you know, of course, we're often interested in the norm of this vector, so we actually have to have techniques for dealing with these norms, moving the norms around and manipulating them. 
But actually, the norms all end up turning out to be probabilities. So we'll end up, we end up ending, estimating these norms by when we make measurements, we find the probability of success will be like one over the norm of, of a vector. So but that's actually, I mean, that's more than I wanted to say. But since you brought up a rather deep point, I thought I'd address it. Yeah. Right. If the speed up here takes place with whether it's quantum or zero, it represents all of them simultaneously. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, so, and and in fact, we have to take a lot of trouble. So, I, I hope everybody's hearing these questions. These are all extremely important questions. So, um, the idea, if you, the idea here is that that quantum computers work because you're representing all these bits simultaneously. The information you're manipulating are then in these, these amplitudes, these complex amplitudes here. And classical computers simply don't have that in them. They could have one of these, back, one of these they, they have, could have a list of all these components right here. OK? So yeah, but since you said it better than I, I so the answer is, to your question is yes, <laughs> since you expressed it so eloquently. Yeah. Yeah, let me tell you what we need to do to do this, OK? Because one of the reasons, um, so I'm, I'm making this, this claim that if we can manipulate these relatively small vectors quantum mechanically, we should be able to find out very interesting features of these, of these vectors. And if we have large collections of vectors, we ought to be able to do machine learning on them. So suppose our, our data set it consists of 2 to the m vectors of this form. So it's some huge honking set of data. And we want to perform manipulations of those. And basically, what I'm going to argue is that we can. And I'm, I will probably not have time to sketch out. I'm relying on you to tell me how much time I have in the suit, because I don't have a, um, I don't have a, uh, a watch. So. so. It's, uh, oh, I see. Oh, it's, I, 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 it's, a, it's a digital clock. I see. No wonder. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I see it now. I see the clock. It's fine. <laughs> OK. All right, so, so, so now let me, um, uh, so everybody, everything everybody said is correct right now. So let me say how you do these kinds of things. And let me tell you the necessary ingredients, the, the ingredients we need to make this happen. So the first, the first component, maybe even you should call it the, the so, uh, uh, so the, well, zero is just the idea is that, that quantum mechanics allows uh, uh, manipulation of vectors in c to the 2 to the n using only n qubits. That's the basic feature. So I'm just putting that up there. So what do we need? First of all, if we have classical data of the form, you know, of this form, I guess I can just write it as x, we need to create this vector x. So we have this gigantic list of bits, and we need to create this vector. So we need to be able to do this mapping from this large set into some kind of quantum mechanical state. Now, this actually sounds kind of uh, like it might be very hard to do. But um, <coughs> actually, merely to map a very large amount of information to a quantum mechanical state is a rather easy thing to do. And I'll do it right now. So here I have a, a CD. Right? It's got like, you know, a couple billion, 10 billion bits on it, something like that. Um, it consists of a very large number, 10 billion very small either mirrors for a 1 or a lack of a mirror for a 0. And the way you normally read it is that you just have a laser focused at one point. It spins very rapidly. You look at the reflections off this point. However, if I want to map this gigantic vector of bits onto a quantum state, of some quantum system, I can do that very simply. I take a single photon, a single particle of light. I send it through a lens. It spreads it out. It's in a circle that just encompasses the CD. It bounces off of it. There's one photon. In the case where there's a mirror, the photon gets reflected. 
into the mode of the electromagnetic field that corresponds to this little tiny mirror. And there's a case where there's no mirror, the photon is absorbed, and the state of the single photon after it's bounced off the CD is now a quantum superposition of being in all the different modes where there's a one and not being in all the different modes where there's a zero. So it's actually not so hard to create a quantum state that has this funny form. I mean, this one photon just created this quantum state, basically, if these are zeros and ones, right? These x's are zeros and ones, and then, then I end up with a superposition of photon in all the states where there were ones. So it's not hard to do. What's hard is to get the, the information in a form where you can manipulate it, okay? I know this sounds like it's like a cheap trick, but it's really, it's really true. I mean, if you actually, you go to quantum optics people and they say, okay, describe to me the state of the single photon going off of it, they'll write something with a whole bunch of annihilation creation operators, but it'll be that state. Yeah? Yeah, that's, that's an extremely good point. And, and actually, the analog with holography is a good one. The, though, um, uh, uh, there's, there's one thing that's a, a bit, that's actually quite different. So in fact, our goal here is not to take our classical information and to expand it into a quantum state where there's more information, it's to take our classical information and to compress it into a quantum state where there's way less information. I mean, you know, actually, if you have n qubits and you just want to store Classical bits, you can only store n classical bits. And we, our data set had two to the n bits in it. So in fact, these vectors that we're creating, um, when I create this, bounce a single photon off of this, the single photon in itself does not possess 10 billion bits. Right? In fact, if I go and measure it, I'm only going to say, is it in this mode or is it not? It's only going to possess like basically a bit. But, but uh, uh, so my quantum state is much more compressed in the classical state, that's the first thing. And then your second question, which is, well, what about noise? That's a very important question, because as we all know, quantum systems are much more susceptible to noise than classical systems. Systems that involve waves, like analog systems, are more susceptible to noise than digital systems. So the question is, is this susceptible to noise or not? And I'll address that in a bit. In a, sorry, a little while down the road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean that if you shot atomic photons and kept measuring every single one, you could statistically find out how many were the zeros? Oh, yeah. Not yeah. Not a statistician, but you know, how many were zeros and how many were ones? Right. In fact, in, just in the same way that if you were to read this out one photon at a time with a conventional laser, right, you could read it out one photon, one pixel at a time, one mirror at a time. If you expanded on all the photons, if you took 10 billion photons and bounced it off of this, then you'd have enough information, those photons, to recreate what happened here. Of course, it might be a little hard. You'd have to have a pretty fancy optical system to get it. Yeah, but that's, that's just so. So there's a little story about this. So, so now, um, uh, so we need to create x. Creating this is OK. And we have to put it in digital form. That is to say, qubit, qubit form. And for this, the, the, the device that does this is what's called a quantum random access memory. And because we're at, at um, because this is Google, I, this, I have to tell the story because, so, um, <clears throat> all right. So in, this, in 2004, in the spring of 2004, I was at a dinner in Monterey associated with an early TED concert, conference, and it was called the Billionaire's Banquet. And you might ask me what I was doing at a billionaire call, a dinner called the Billionaire's Banquet. It was, I was basically the guy who jumped out of the cake, you know, wearing a bikini. Right? That was basically, <laughs> basically my role there. And there I met the founders of your glorious organization, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. And it turned out they were extremely interested in quantum computing. 
because they had actually been graduate students at um, Stanford with Ike Chuang, who's now a professor at MIT, who's one of the main people in quantum computing. And so we spent a long time talking at this banquet. And at the end of it, we agreed that my postdocs and I would come up with something that would be called quantum internet search. <laughs> now, <laughs> we didn't know what it was, because it's much better to come up with the name first. And of course, the reason is to have something that could be you know, trademarked as Krugel, right? So for quantum internet search. So, <clears throat> so, and it turned out to be very hard to come up with something that was good for this. But we realized that after like three years, OK, we realized that if you could build a quantum random access memory, which is a device that basically takes you know, this information and encodes it in a digital form, a quantum digital form, then you could do the following thing. If you encoded a database in quantum mechanical form, then someone could access the database, so access Krugel. You could ask Krugel a question, and you could get the answer back. And when you're done, you know for absolute sure, guaranteed by the laws of figure, uh, physics, that Krugel doesn't know the question. <laughs> uh, 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 it's actually, this seems impossible because actually classically, you know, classically to do this, you actually have to recode your entire database for the person who's making the private query. So Google would have to recode their entire database according to someone who gives them a private code, and they're not going to do that, right? That's a bit expensive. But quantum mechanically, it's easy. It actually has to do with the so-called no cloning problem. The, the solution is when Krugel sends back the answer, they also send back the question. And in quantum mechanics, there's something called the no cloning theorem, which says, if you don't know a quantum state, you can't make a copy of it. So if Krugel sends back the question, then the person who answer, asked the question in the first place can check to see if it's the same question. If it's the same question, then Krugel didn't keep a copy. And so this is guaranteed to be secure. So it's provably secure given the laws of physics. OK, fine. That, that three years passed. We patented it because I'd had a terrible experience because my graduate student, Bill Kaminsky, and I in 2001, 2002 wrote a series of papers about how you build an adiabatic quantum computer using superconducting systems with phase qubits and trilayer Niobian lithography with uh, inductive couplings. And we didn't patent it because we did a back of the envelope calculation. We realized that once you got more than a few hundred qubits, it wouldn't be adiabatic anymore and it wouldn't work. And then, so we didn't patent it. Then D-Wave spent $100 million building a superconducting adiabatic quantum computer with trilayer and iobian lithography with flux qubits and uh, the inductive couplings. And we felt pretty dumb. So we patented this, this uh, quantum random access memory. And then at, at some other boutique kind of conference in Napa Valley, I met Sergey and Larry again. And in the hot tub at like 2 in the morning, I said, <laughs> OK, like you guys just bought YouTube. We've got this great thing for you. No, we worked really hard. It took three years. It's yours if you wanted. You first access to it, you don't want it to become Quahu. Uh, so, <laughs> and they were like, wow, wow, this is like really super cool. So they, they like, you know, after, after the next day, they came around and they said, they came to me, they had looked really sorrowful, and they said, Seth, you know, we talked with our business guy. We just agreed that, you know, our, our corporate philosophy is to know everything about everybody. And we just couldn't possibly invest in a technology that involved not knowing about people. I said, look, you know, look, you're not getting this right. You know, there's the European Court of Justice. It's like, you know, suing you. You've all got all these problems. And, and so, look, look, here, let's do it this way. You give me $10 million, OK? And I won't do anything. <laughs> OK. So, so I'm not creating a competitor for Google because I'm not doing anything, so that's fine. Meanwhile, you tell the European Court of Justice, look, we care so much about people's privacy. We've invested $10 million in this brand new technology which will absolutely guarantee people's privacy with internet search. And then the European Court of Justice will be happy. So European Court of Justice is happy. You're happy. I'm really happy. <laughs> but they didn't see it that way. It was very sad. <laughs> anyway, so these QRAMs can now be used for, um, for these kinds of processes. Now, and um, uh, I won't, uh, so it's a very interesting question of how you build them. Uh, if you look at our patent, you can find out you could build them with optical methods. You could build them using superconducting circuits. I know that actually there's a, an effort here to do, build things that are much more ambitious and more interesting than a QRAM. But for this, it's just quantum random access memory, which allows us to create these vectors. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are we separate 
Yeah, that, that's a, a very good question. So, and this is actually shows insight into um, uh, something that somebody asked earlier about. It's often very hard in a quantum computer to figure out how to get the, the information out. So what we have to do is not only show that you can do the kinds of manipulations we, knew to do thing, we need to do to do things like clustering algorithms to build support vector machines, that kind of thing, or uh, the stuff that I'm doing with Paolo here to do quantum versions of topological big data analysis. We have to show that having done that analysis, that the information in the quantum states is the form we need to actually get the information out. So let me actually address that um, in, uh, in what I'm going to talk about right now. OK. So now we need, having constructed these data, we need to, need to construct, and now, using quantum, basically techniques from quantum computation and quantum information processing, exploiting, I mean empowering, empowering those atoms, those superconducting circuits and those photons to do these manipulations, we need to construct things like, such as, construct, for example, things like inner products, you know, x dot y, overlaps between vectors. That's easy. This is takes time order n. So this is logarithmic in the size of the vector. OK? So that's the first kind of step that you might want to do. We might want to do things as we might want to compare some vector x with the mean value of some other vectors. This is a basic step in the clustering algorithm k-means, right? In k-means, your job is to take a whole bunch of vectors and to divide them up into clusters. And the idea is you start, assign the, the standard algorithm, which, by the way, happens to be called Lloyd's algorithm, but it, it was made by Stuart Lloyd in the 1950s. I don't think he's any relation to us so far as I know. But. <laughs> anyway, so you, know, you have a bunch of vectors. The way that Lloyd's algorithm works is you take a bunch of seeds, guesses for the centers of the clusters. You assign each vector to the nearest cluster. And then and when everything's done, you calculate the mean values of the clusters, and then you just do it again. Now you reassign to the nearest mean. And then you keep on doing until it converges. So <clears throat> that's the kind of thing you'd want to do is calculate the uh, uh, the distance of a vector to a cluster of vector, and this is also takes time order n. So logarithmic in the dimension of the Hilbert space and logarithmic in the number of vectors in, in the Hilbert space. So j equals 1 to m. This goes as order n log of m. So these are all, if you actually compare these with the exact versions for the classical ones, you may notice something that these things, you know, calculating this exactly for classical vectors takes time 2 to the n, because you've got to sum up all 2 to the n components. Approximating it by various sneaky techniques by Monte Carlo or sampling can take time, order n, but not always. So there's very interesting questions about how much better we're doing than good heuristic algorithms. But if I'm comparing this algorithms that we're making to just the kind of like straight up classical versions of these algorithms, the quantum versions of these algorithms are exponentially faster than the classical ones, the straight up classical ones. I'm not saying that they're not excellent heuristic clustering algorithms. Of course, there are excellent heuristic clustering algorithms. I'm just saying that these quantum algorithms that we have are exponentially faster than the corresponding classical ones. OK? So, um, so, 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 and for instance, we can do things like k-means. If you do the quantization of this Lloyd's algorithm, then you end up with something like kn log m, which is for in order to do the k-means Lloyd's algorithm versus the quantum, this is quantum, and versus k times 2 to the n times m, this is the classical, k squared, sorry, for the classical one. So, so when you actually start quantizing these algorithms, what you find is that what you get is assignments of vectors to clusters that are a lot faster than you had previously. And now this starts to, is an attempt to answer these questions that have been raised about how you measure stuff, what the output of this is, of this algorithm is, is it says, OK, it gives you a 
quantum superposition of a list of vectors that are assigned to a particular cluster. So of course, it could be a very, very, very large number of those vectors. And if you wanted to know all of them, you'd have to do the algorithm many, many times. But if all you want to do is sample representative members of this cluster, then these algorithms are exponentially faster than the classical versions. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure. So, so what this is, this actually, what you calculate quantum mechanically is, is this, right? This is, this is the, the true Dirac bracket. This is called a bra, not an article of women's clothing. Then this is a cat. So this together is a bracket. This is why this notation is what it's supposed to be. So this is the inner product between these vectors. So this is equal to norm of x, norm of y. Sorry, this is equal to uh, x dot y over norm of x norm of y. So, ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a hard, but that's hard to do. I mean, this is, this is, this raises a whole bunch of interesting open questions, actually. So for instance, just evaluating x dot y, x dot y is, is often very easy to do. You can do this with like order n steps quite accurately by Monte Carlo. But if you take something like x with some transformation of y, like the Fourier transform of this vector y, then there's no known way, and it seems very unlikely you, should, you could do this with classical Monte Carlo, whereas this is very easy to do quantum mechanically. Indeed, what can you do quantum mechanically? So here are the tools. So what did I describe there? I described this quantum version of Lloyd's algorithm, quantum clustering algorithm. Let's look at the other tools that, <coughs> excuse me, that we actually have. Sorry, it's, it's too warm here, so it's making me cough. <laughs> it was five degrees when I left Boston. <coughs> so we can, take, um, we can take a vector x, and we can map it. We can do the Fourier transform. This corresponds to taking a quantum vector and doing the quantum Fourier transform. So the classical, so the classical time for this takes time order n 2 to the n for the fast classical fast Fourier transform, even for the fastest Fourier transform in the West. And this takes time. <laughs> order n squared. So things that involve Fourier transforms are exponentially faster quantum mechanically. I mean, here's the, these are, you know, you take a 2 to the n vector. You have to 2 to the n by 2 to the n ma sparse matrix. That's not easy to do. Here is another thing that's very quite useful. If I take a x, sorry, if I take x goes to a inverse x where this is sparse, where A is a sparse matrix. This is order, again, n times 2 to the n classical. <clears throat> and then the quantum version of this, this is, once again, this is actually just order. Yeah, once again, order n squared, maybe n cubed, depending on how accurate you want it to be, quantum mechanical. So matrix inversion for sparse matrices is also exponentially faster than, uh, than in a quantum mechanical system than in a classical version. Um, in fact, uh, one of our, our, our third algorithm, this is our first algorithm right here, this clustering algorithm we came up. Um, well, I'll call it our second algorithm, even though it's our third algorithm. Um, so this actually, if you look at these kinds of manipulations like this, if I have a bunch of data points right here, and suppose that I want to create a support vector machine. So what does a support vector machine does? Support vector machine identifies the maximum margin hyperplanes that separate these two data points right here. So if I have this set of data points, it's a big set of vectors. I have this set of data points. It's a big set of vectors. You can basically construct support vector machines Um, by doing linear manipulations and matrix inversion on the so-called covariance matrix of this data. 
And you can actually show that constructing the covariance matrix and performing the requisite matrix inversion, finding the, you know, the, solving the linear equations, you have to find these kernel operators, blah, 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 as they say. <laughs> then you find that this quantum support vector machine has exactly the same kind of feature. So then, uh, and then of course, the kind of question that you want to ask is, here is another data point. Does it belong over here or does it belong over there? So you can show that constructing these hyperplanes, finding these vectors from the data, and then comparing this data point to find out, is it closer to this side or is it closer to that side? That can all, again, be done in time order n, where the classical versions all take time order 2 to the n. And the reason is, again, I'm just, just to remind you of why this is, um, it's because uh, you can do these kinds of linear transformations, simple linear transformations, like quantum Fourier transforms or matrix inversion solving sets of linear equations on very high dimensional vector spaces is actually quite easy quantum mechanically. It's because, you know, these transformations, it's like, you know, what is this photon doing when it bounces off this CD? You know, it's, it's a photon is a quantum mechanical object moving through a humongous dimensional vector space, the vector space of all the propagational modes of the electromagnetic field. You know, it bounces off of here, and quantum mechanics automatically does this linear transformation. In fact, just sending a single photon through a diffraction grating is exactly performing a Fourier transform on the mode labels of the photon for people who know optics kinds of stuff. So in fact, these kinds of transformations like doing Fourier transforms, and if you, if you, there are many quantum mechanical systems that do things that look like they would be very hard from a classical computational perspective, and they just do them automatically because that's, that's just what they do. They're quantum things, and performing you know, linear transformations on quantum things like Fourier transforms is what happens. OK. So <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm almost out of time. When do you want me to stop? It's like. Uh, it's 158 right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let me just, um, I'll, I'm going to advertise one more nice thing because this is the work, because since Paolo Zanardi is here from USC, and this is the work that we've been doing recently. That, so was there a question? Or did I just, was this just an echo? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so th this, is a very, uh, this is a very fun um, <coughs> topic, um, is a topological topological big data analysis. So this is, you know, you've got a whole bunch of data points. They're in some funny shape. But there's a hole in the middle, right? <laughs> right? Well, there's a hole. A hole is a topological feature. How the hell do you find the hole? OK? And this goes under the name of persistent homology. Uh, who, who here has, has heard of this, this stuff here, this, uh, these topological methods? They're, um, they were developed by um, Carlson at, at UC San Diego, though I found out from, I'm sorry? He's now at Stanford. He was at UC San Diego. Yeah. He, but I found out from Michael Friedman, who is this fields medalist who actually does uh, quantum computing stuff, that Michael Friedman developed the whole method in a secret DARPA program or ARPA program in the, in the early in the 1960s. <laughs> and he showed me his recently declassified notes. Anyway, so this is actually really cool. So, so, <clears throat> so, <laughs> so what is persistent homology? You think, wow, topological features, how do we actually, how do we actually find those kinds of things. So the way persistent homology works is you basically, you, you tessellate or triangulate, if you like, this kind of systems right here. You create what's called a simplicial complex, okay? So you create a topology, a notion of things that are close to each other, topology, and then you create this simplicial complex <clears throat> I'm not going to draw all the simplicities because there are too many. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this, right? So now the great thing is that now the next step, and this is what I all learned from Paolo here, right here. The next step in, in this homology is each simplex 
gets mapped to a vector in a gigantic, <coughs> gigantic complex dimensional vector space, complex vector space of high dimension. And then finding, finding holes, you know, voids, uh, connected components, et cetera. This is just linear algebra now. So, so what, something that looks like it might have nothing whatsoever to do with, um, with uh, uh, things that you could quantize, that is performing linear algebra operations on large dimensional Hilbert spaces, vector spaces, excuse me. If you actually go into what's called algebraic topology, it turns out that the way people do algebraic topology is to say, we can't deal with these like topological spaces. Let's map everything into vectors on some gigantic dimensional vector space, and let's do linear operations on that. It's a great field. <laughs> but it's a great field that actually happens to be perfectly adapted for making these quantum mechanical algorithms. And the quantum mechanical algorithms, um, as you might not be surprised after this, out of this, if this is an M, the, the classical algorithms, classical go as 2 to the M, where M is the dimension of the vector space, and the quantum go as M. So <clears throat> these uh, quantum algorithms, again, give exponential speed up. So Masood is looking edgy right there. I know what happens. That means he's about to beat me up. I'll get you a beer later, Masood. Don't worry. Uh, <clears throat> so but let me, let me just then, then uh, conclude. All right, so what happened? So we gave a, uh, there was a short course in quantum mechanics. Everybody passed. <laughs> Sorry, only, I was supposed to be here a few days earlier, but then I had to give all these graduate oral exams, which I think is, you know, the graduate students should go to the dentist themselves, I feel. <clears throat> So I'm tired of failing people. So everybody passed? All right. So quantum mechanics has this weird feature that you know, things we think of as particles correspond to waves. They can be in two places. Electrons can be in two places at once. Mathematically, this means that the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics is that the states of quantum mechanical systems, these waves, are in fact vectors in high dimensional vector spaces. And the kind of transformations that happen when things like you know, particles of light bounce off of CDs are just linear transformations on these high dimensional vector spaces. Quantum computing is, is the effort to exploit, I mean, or empower quantum systems to uh, transform, allow these linear transformations to perform the kinds of things that we ourselves would like to do for manipulating data in this quantum mechanical form. And if you have a quantum random access memory, which allows you to map data onto big data into big quantum data. I learned, you know, I know, I know for a fact, being in academia, that, that in order to get a grant these days, you either have to have the word big data in your title or graphene. So what we're aiming for here is graphene-based quantum random access memory for quantum big data analysis, right? It's, it's, it's a winner. I can, I can just smell the, the funds coming in. All right. <clears throat> so you have a quantum random access memory that maps your classical data onto a quantum state. This actually turns out to be something that's a lot easier than technically than full-blown quantum computing. Initial experiments and, and proof of principles has been done. It's been patented because I learned my damn lesson with D-Wave the first time around. Um, <clears throat> then, um, then we have to make sure that we can actually do the manipulations that we need to do, the various linear transformations, evaluating inner products and distances, looking at, at means and clustering. These turn out to be all accessible on a quantum computer. And compared with their classical versions, they're exponentially faster. Then you go to more fancy stuff. You find you can do Fourier transforms. You find that you can do matrix inversion. You can solve systems of linear equations. You can do things like you know, find kernels of, high, of, of operators in high dimensional spaces, which is the essence of actually doing this persistent homology. And so what we found is that once you have this first step of this dumbass intuition that Patrick Rebentros came up with, it's like, Whoa, you know, lots of machine learning is about manipulating large numbers of vectors in high dimensional vector spaces. Gee, quantum mechanics is about manipulating large numbers of vectors in high dimensional vector spaces. Wouldn't it be fun if we could bring them together? This dumb ass intuition turns out to be correct. And so now we're working with a whole variety of people, and here, of course, with the people at folks at Google Research, to try to make this vision of actually doing big data analysis in intrinsically quantum mechanical ways that are potentially much more efficient than the classical ways to make that a reality. 
Thank you. Thanks, Ed, for uh, this nice introduction to quantum mechanics and quantum machine learning. So uh, are there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a really that's a very interesting question. So, uh, uh, quantum mechanics on itself seems to be exactly linear. So we have no, um, no, uh, at a fundamental level, all the experiments indicate that quantum mechanics is linear to like one part in ten to the eighteenth or even better. However, you can you can actually the the word linear is used in a, a variety of ways. So you can certainly have nonlinear interactions in quantum mechanics. The interaction of light with matter is nonlinear typically. So, like absorption of light and matter is nonlinear. That's a nonlinear interaction. But the waves, the quantum mechanical waves, still superpose in a linear fashion. So, in some such systems, as in, for instance, Bose Einstein condensates, you can actually emulate what would be a, a fundamental nonlinearity by manipulating using these you know, existing nonlinear interactions. But, but quantum mechanics is basically the way that we know it. You know, it is linear, exactly linear, and so we're stuck with that linearity at this fundamental level. So, yeah. And in the number of vectors. Uh, oh, sorry. It, it, you know, the, the, well, normally to compare, if in the normal k-means goes as m squared, where m is the number of vectors, and ours goes as log m. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, when I take something, when I take m and take it to log m, I call that an exponential speed up. Right. right. That's what I mean. Yeah. Because saying a logarithmic speed up doesn't sound. I mean, it's true that, like, say, taking m to log m, calling, wow, it's a logarithmic speed up. Nobody gets very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, taking m to log m is an exponential speed up. So I, I call it that. It sounds more exciting. It's also true. So. <laughs> In, yeah, you can't always. I mean, we've tried lots of stuff. We haven't been. There are many things we haven't been able to do. So, so for instance, um, one thing that we we can solve. Um, uh, this is this is uh, things that people. I want to talk with people about here. So, we can solve um, a linear equations with um, and even uh, polynomial or nonlinear equations with um, equality constraints, because then a Lagrangian method turns us into another set of linear equations that we can solve. But it's hard. To, we can't do that with inequality constraints. So and these show up all the time in, in, in uh, machine learning. You know, you have some convex space. You're trying to in identify the interior of the convex space. Like the support vectors like lie on the exterior of this. And you want to say you have a, a, you're solving some equation with inequality constraints. And then you're, you're stuck with you know, kirsch kuhn tucker equations. And who knows what the hell to do then? And we don't know what to do. We've tried really hard all kinds of methods. So, so uh, basically, what we've been doing right now is, you know, we've been doing the stuff we know how to do well, like solve linear equations, do Fourier transforms, identify kernels and eigenspaces. Oh, we can diagonalize matrices and find eigenvectors and eigenvalues. That's something you can do very effectively in a quantum computer. But there's some things we can't do, and so we don't. We certainly this is not um, a magic bullet. Even if you could build a large-scale quantum computer, this wouldn't even be, wouldn't be a magic bullet to solve all machine learning problems. No, by no means. Was there another question over here? Yes. So what's the current standard of, uh, you know, product of, of what, I'm sorry? Product, real product, what's the current Oh, our product. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, don't have, I, don't have like, I don't have a product except a lot of phonons. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we are, we are, I am not a company. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so but in, in terms of, um, Building quantum computers. So, basically, what's happening right now is that there there are, are um, small scale quantum computers with a few tens of quantum bits, and we're hoping to have like you know within the next five years or so, there are people like John Martinez who say he'll build you a quantum computer with a hundred quantum bits. I don't know if it's true, uh, but it's quite possible. Uh, and but I, I think actually the way to go here is is one of the the um, the philosophies behind this approach is. The people in quantum computing, which is a field that's been around maybe for almost 20 years now, um, 
has, uh, is a very young field, have been talking about trying to build very general purpose quantum computers that act in the same way the regular digital computers do, but operate in a fully quantum mechanical fashion. But I think one of the philosophies that I pursue, and certainly the people here at Google are pursuing, is to try to construct, because you know, there's this intrinsic power in the way that quantum mechanical systems behave, can we actually construct devices that, um, I'm going to say, I was about to say exploit again. It's like really hard. Like when you're a professor of engineering at MIT, like not to say we exploit the properties of this material. It's like, so <laughs> can we find ways of using, of using these, this, this ability of quantum systems intrinsically to perform operations in the high dimensional vector spaces without actually having to go through this whole, the entire digital formalism? You know, the fact that, the fact that a diffraction grading makes a Fourier transform, right, automatically. Can we use that kind of thing to actually construct devices that would do this kind of manipulations without having to go the route of making a large-scale quantum computer? That's what we're aiming for. And there, I think that it's actually, I think there's very good possibilities for that. OK. Uh, yeah. That's the last question. Yeah, yeah. Electrons and protons are completely different. Why don't we see more uh, quantum computers being built on the macro scale that we just talked about? Something that I mean, we're going back to. No, actually, I mean, you, you do see that. In fact, this is a very exciting. I just uh, last. Uh, Thursday and Friday, I was at a conference at BBN in Cambridge about it was the first conference on integrated quantum nanophotonics. Okay, so, so one of the big developments in just in switching theory right now that, or, or practice is the development of integrated photonics, right? So you, you etch waveguides in silicon, you can put millions of switches on a silicon wafer. And um, so for many years, there have been lots of experiments in quantum computing that did computation using, quantum computation using interactant of light and polarization with atoms. And all these experiments look the same because all optical experiments look the same. There's a gigantic optical table and all these lasers off on the side and a million mirrors there and then light, light beams are bouncing around all over the place and you have no idea what's going on. And every single optical experiment looks like that, right? So a, a remarkable thing is now happening, driven actually by the desire of places like IBM to, to build these on-chip switching arrays, is that these gigantic interferometers with interactions between light and matter are now being miniaturized into individual wafers. So, so you know, a a a uh, a a three centimeter, or well, let's say let's they're slightly bigger than that. So thirty thirty centimeter silicon wafer contains an interferometer that would have taken five optical tables previously. So I think there's a lot of hope for that. Um, uh, the the real problems are getting strong interactions between light and matter. Uh, superconducting systems are a very good way to go there. There, in fact, there's a strong analog between between transmissions of microwaves in microwave superconducting microwave line and analogs of photons. In fact, it's so strong because it, they're the same thing. They're microwave photons. And then, but instead of atoms, you can use these little superconducting quantum bits that now interact much, 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 much strongly with these microwave photons than ordinary light interacts with atoms. So there's a lot of, a lot of great quantum technologies out there. And as usual, a lot of the progress in this field is being made by the combination of Industrial push creating new new technologies and fabrication technologies that allow us to do things we couldn't before, and then uh, pull from application, um, both you know classical and quantum application. But of course, what you're saying is completely correct, and I think there's a lot of hope in the near future to have much more powerful devices that use these techniques. Okay, uh, let's thank thanks again, uh, Seth, for coming. Here. Thank you. <laughs>